Amen. Good to see you here tonight. I invite you to take God's Word, please, and open to the book of 2 Kings. We are continuing our study through First and 2 Kings. It's been a long study, and we're in chapter 14 tonight of 2 Kings, uh, chapter 14, and uh, I'll just read verse 3 of chapter 14, talking about the king Amaziah. It says, and he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, yet not like David his father, he did according to all as Joash his father did. In verse 4, Howbeit the high places were not taken away, as yet the people did sacrifice and burn incense on the high places. Now tonight I want to talk about the sin of kings. There have been many kings in history that thought that they were truly great. There was one king in particular that stands out with respect to this. His name was Louis the Great of France. He was actually Louis the Fourteenth. And he set out to be not just a good king, but he wanted to be a great king. He wanted to be renowned. He wanted to be glorious. And so there's a lot of things he did to kind of to, uh, to make that happen. One thing he did was he, uh, uh, he built the, the palace of Versailles. He surrounded himself with opulence. He was the one that came up with the expression um, that I am the state. Um, he believed that a king should have absolute sovereign power, and so he set out to make sure that he had a- absolute power, and that is he put down all the nobles around him. And so um, he basically uh, had total control and total power and uh, reigned for a long time there in France. He ruled with an iron hand, and uh, to most of people in Europe, he was the grand monarch. But, and prior to his death, when he realized he was going to die, he had a coffin of gold made for him, and, and he gave strict instructions at his funeral that there would be a, a little candle lit on the coffin to dis- demonstrate his greatness. Everything else in the cathedral was to be dark except for this one candle, and the light of that candle was to demonstrate the greatness of uh, King Louis. Well, when the bishop got up to, uh, to do the funeral, the first thing that Bishop Massillon did was he reached down and he snuffed out the candle and he made this expression. He said, only God is great. Only God is great. Well, that's so very true. The, the, the sin of uh, King Louis is the sin of many earthly kings or really anyone who has a position of authority. That is, it's a, it's a sin that is uh, very tempting, very easily to succumb to, and that's the sin of pride. Kings forget the important lesson that God had to teach to the arrogant king Nebuchadnezzar, he had to learn this the hard way, that God is the one who's the king. He's the one who's in control. Remember, Daniel said it like this in Daniel 4, 17, the most high rules in the kingdom of men, and he gives it to whomsoever he will. God is in control. Now, as we continue our study into First and Second Kings, we come now to this section of kings. Now, from 2 Kings chapter 11 to chapter 16, there are 13 different kings that are mentioned here in this section. Five are from the southern kingdom of Judah, and eight are from the northern kingdom of Israel. We've already looked at several of these kings, but we're going to kind of take a look at chapter 14 through chapter 16. Don't be afraid. I'm going to look at it in a summary fashion, all right? It's going to kind of feel like you may be a little bit in a survey class here with First and Second Kings. But I just want to, to show you what the writer is really focusing on as he goes through these kings kind of in a summary fashion. He is demonstrating, again, the failure of earthly monarchs. And the reason that Judah and Israel went off into exile and went off into bondage was not because of the unfaithfulness of God. It wasn't because God didn't keep his word. It was because of the failure of these kings. And the people followed in their failure. Now, let me just review with you a little bit of where we are in our study of First and Second Kings, kind of give you a, a, just a quick summary of what we have done so far. You remember that First and Second Kings is really one long book in the Hebrew Bible. In the English Bible, we divide it up to First and Second Kings. However, it's one long book. It's one continuous story that actually comes out of the book of Samuel. And it, as it starts out, David has unified all the tr- tribes of Israel into a kingdom and God promised that from his line, the Messiah, a Messiah king would come and to establish God's kingdom over the nations and fulfill all the promises that God made to Abraham. And so the book of Kings tells about this long line of kings that came after David, and yet none of them live up to that promise. None of them. In fact, they ran the nation into the ground. And the one common denominator of all these kings is their sin of pride. They're just very proud. Proud. 
Pride explains why eventually the, the kingdom of Israel, the kingdom of David, actually split into two kingdoms. You might remember that. We see this in 1 Kings 12 to 16. Rehoboam brought that, that, that split about. But just remember that when David was dying, he gave some solemn words to his son Solomon. They were very sim- similar to the words that Moses gave to Joshua, and it was basically this. It was a call to remain faithful to the covenant, to remain faithful to the word of God to give allegiance to God alone. And Solomon started out well. For the most part, he followed his father's advice. His his brightest moment comes when he realizes he doesn't have enough wisdom to lead, and so he goes to the Lord at Gibeon, and he says, Lord, I'm just a child. Give me wisdom. And God indeed does give him wisdom. And then Solomon really does well in completing the dream that his father David had and completing the building of the temple. But it seems like as soon as Solomon got finished building that temple he begins to make really, really bad choices, which is ironic because he's supposed to be the wisest man in the world at this time, right? And wisdom is really the choices that you make, but he makes really bad choices. And we see that in chapters 9 to 11 in 1 Kings. He starts marrying the daughters of other other kings. He He marries hundreds of them for political alliances. And then he adopts their gods into Israel. He introduces the worship of those gods into Israel. And then he accumulates huge, huge amounts of wealth. He builds a huge army. He institutes slave labor to build his, uh, all the projects he had. And if you go back to Deuteronomy 17, which is the guideline that God gives for kings and how they're supposed to rule, what you find out is that the writer is purposely showing how that Solomon broke every one of those guidelines. He didn't fulfill any of that. He's breaking every one of them. So that by the time he dies, Solomon resembles Pharaoh, king of Egypt, more than he does David, his father. He should have been another David. He should have been like his father. And yet he's more like a Pharaoh of Egypt. And so hope is lost here. And then his son Rehoboam, he also reigns in pride. And rather than, you know, pulling back on the taxing of the people, he, he decides he's going he's to make it even worse. It's really a sad story of greed and lust for power. And as a result, the kingdom splits. And then you have Jeroboam, who is the king over um, the northern tribes of Israel. And you remember what he does. He builds two uh, golden calves. He puts one at Dan. He puts one at Bethel. And now he's competing with Rehoboam for the people's affection. He starts a new religion. And these golden calves are really connected to Exodus 32, as the writer shows. And so what happens is, is that people begin to plunge into idolatry. They begin to plunge into false worship. And so the story goes back and forth. It goes from a northern kings to the southern kings. We'll take a look at a few of the northern kings, and we find out that really none of them are good. In fact, there are 20 northern kings that are looked at. There are none of them that are evaluated by the writer as being good. There are zero for 20. No king from the north is given a good uh, rating or evaluation. There are 20 kings basically of the south, and only eight of those are given a good report about how they reign as kings. And so the, the bottom line with the, that the writer used were just certain things. Did they, did they worship God alone? Did they rid the land of the high places? That was a guideline that the writer used. How, did they, how were they in comparison to David? David was the gold standard. Well, how were they in comparison to David? Did they rid the land of these high places? Are they remaining faithful to the covenant that God gave to Israel? And uh, what we find out is that it's none of, none of them do. Again, there's only eight of these kings, eight out of 40, that even come close to a positive rating, which connects another huge purpose of the book, and that is the introduction of the role of prophet. They are key figures in the history of Israel. And in the Bible, prophets were not fortune tellers. Rather, they were men called of God on the behalf of Israel, and they really played the role of covenant watchdog. They were making sure that the kings were fulfilling their role to follow the law of God and to follow the covenant, which means it was, a, it was the job of the prophets to call out kings for, the, for their idolatry, which if you were a prophet and you lived back then, that wasn't a desirable thing to do because very few of them were doing right. And it made the kings mad, and so therefore the prophets were persecuted, some, some were killed. But they were constantly reminding Israel of their calling as to be the light to the nations, that they should obey the commandments of the Torah. And so 
the, really the middle section from 1 Kings 13 to 2 Kings chapter 8, what we see are the rising up of these prophets. And there are two that are preeminent, and we looked at their lives. One was Elijah, and his nemesis was Ahab, right? And Jezebel, his Canaanite wife, and they tried to replace the worship of God with the worship of Baal, and Elijah was there to stop them, to confront them on that. And there's that famous confrontation that took place there on Mount Carmel. And then after Elijah, there was Elisha. Elijah gives his, his mantle of prophetic authority to Elisha. And Elisha, remember, asked for two times the power of Elijah. And it's interesting in the books of First and Second Kings, what you find is 14 miracles of Elisha. There are seven miracles of Elijah. And so God answers that. But ultimately, neither Elijah nor Elisha were successful in turning Israel back from their apostasy. And so the next section of this whole story is after the death of Elisha, which is where we are right now. Elisha dies. He was a great prophet. And the people recognized that. He was the man who really God used to spare Israel and Judah from a lot of their enemies. But what we follow that after the death of it, what we see is after the death of Elisha, it just, it just spirals into being worse. There's coup after coup. There are kings that are killing each other. And as you read these sections, you think you're reading a chapter out of The Godfather because they're killing one another and they're assassinating one another and they're acting in total independence of God. And, and, and beloved, that's exactly what pride is. Pride is acting independent of God. It is thinking that we can do what we do on our own. A, a, a man who is proud says, you know, I don't need God. I'm the, I'm, the, I'm the captain of my fate. I'm the master of my soul. I make the decisions. I make the determinations. That's, that's pride. That's what we see out of these kings. Humility is the exact opposite. Humility says, Lord, I can do nothing without you. I'm absolutely dependent upon you for all things. And the greatest expression of our humility to God is our prayer. It's just calling out to the Lord and crying out to him and asking for his help. But what we see then in the common denominator, the overarching failure of the kings is their pride, and it's manifested in several ways here. And so what I want you to see are then four lessons from this story. And again, we're going to kind of go through these kings quickly in summary fashion, but in doing that, what I want you to see are the four lessons we learn about pride and things that really should warn us to remain humble, humble and dependent on the Lord. Here's, here's lesson number one. Pride precedes destruction. And that's exactly what Proverbs says, right? And we see this illustrated in the lives of two kings. Proverbs 16, 18, pride goeth before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. And the first king we look at is uh, Amaziah. We see him in chapter 14, verses 1 to 20. He's a king of Judah, the southern kingdom. He's a son of Joash. He takes over when he's 25 years old, and he reigns for 29 years and look at verse number three. Again, we're going to just touch a few verses. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, yet not like David his father. And he did according to all things as Joash's father did. So he was righteous like his father, but he was not like David, it says in verse three, yet not like David. Remember, David is the gold standard. He's like Joash, but he's not like David. And then also notice in verse four, how be it the high places were not taken away. And yet the people did sacrifice and burn incense on the high places. Again, this was the one measuring stick that the writer constantly used. Did they take away the high places? And remember, there are only two kings out of all these kings that took away the high places. Do you remember who they are? Okay, nobody, nobody knows? All right, shame on you. All right, thank you. Give that man an extra bulletin. It was... Uh, Josiah and Hezekiah, they were the two kings. I'm glad somebody has been listening to me in this study. I'm just kidding. I know you all are. But you still get an, that one wrong, all right? But, and so what happens here is that um, Amaziah doesn't take away the high places. But he does mention, the writer does mention some of his accomplishments. Look in verse 5. It came to pass as soon as the kingdom was confirmed in his hand that he slew his servants which had slain the king his father. So he executed the men who murdered his father. But he did not execute their children in verse number six. And the writer points that out. That's important because in, in not doing that, he rather than following the tradition of the ancient kings back then of wiping out a rival's family, and so that there's no threat in the future, 
He doesn't do that. He doesn't do what the normal kings would do. Rather, he obeys the Mosaic law because it says in Deuteronomy 24, 16, you're not to do that. And so it shows, again, his allegiance somewhat to the law of God. He's not totally obedient to God's word, but he's partially obedient. And then the next thing we see is he wins a military victory in verse 7. He slew Edom in the Valley of Salt, 10,000, and took Selah by war, and called the name of it Jokthiel unto this day. And so um, he wants to regain control of Edom because it gives access to the southern trade routes. It's good economically for his people. And so he mounts an army, and Second Chronicles 25 gives us a little more detail. He musters up an army of 400,000 men. 100,000 of them were mercenaries which a prophet comes and rebukes him for doing that. Rather than having faith in God, he goes out and hires more soldiers, and the prophet rebukes him. And so what what does he do? He says, okay. He lets those 100 go and decides to trust in the Lord, and as a result of that, God gave him a great military victory. The Bible says 10,000 of the enemy fell in battle or were captured. And so he has this great victory, and in verse 7 it says that he call the name of it Jokthiel, that is, uh, this, this campaign uh, is actually over there by Petra, the city of Petra, and he takes over that area, and um, the, the uh, Edomite capital of Sila, later it's known as Petra, that's the very place, and he gives it a new name, Jokthiel, which means subdued by God, Sub- subdued by God. So he has a great victory, but there's a problem. He's lifted up in pride. And this is, what's, this is how it ends, and it's very sad. Because now, coming off that great victory, a victory that God gave him, mind you, and by the way, let's remind ourselves, any time we have victory in our life, do you think it's us or is it God? It's God, right? So we need to rem- a victory should drive us more to God rather than cause us to act independently. But here, what he does now is he challenges the king of Israel to a war. In verse 8, then Amaziah sent messengers to Jehoash, And then look at the last part of the verse. Come, let us look one another in the face. Doesn't that even sound proud? Let's look eyeball to eyeball. Let's square off. Let's let's fight. It's a challenge to war. And it seems like Amaziah is doing a lot of things that many of us are prone to do, make our own plans, plow, plow forward without seeking God or depending on his guidance or strength. Now, Joash responds by giving him a parable down in verse number 9. And Jehoash, the king of Israel, sent to Amaziah, king of Judah, saying, The thistle that was in Lebanon sent to the cedar that was in Lebanon, saying, Give thy daughter to my son to wife. And there passed by a wild beast that was in Lebanon, and he trod down the thistle. <laughs> well, what's this mean? Well, you know, the thistle was the lowest of the, the plant life in the forest. It was despised, not like the stately cedars of Lebanon. Uh, and so the thistle requests of a cedar to marry the cedar's daughter, which in antiquity was a request that was tantamount to equality. In other words, the thistle was thinking that he was equal with the, with the, uh, the tree of Lebanon. And then what he says, this, the story ends pretty bad because a, a wild beast comes and tramples down the thistle. End of story. And the application of the parable is obvious here. Amaziah enjoyed this great military success against Edom, but now he's a thistle and he thinks he's a Lebanon or a cedar of Lebanon, I should say. This is what the king of Israel is saying. You know, you think you're a Lebanon, a cedar of Lebanon, because you had this one victory? You're not. You're still, you're still a little thistle. You better stay home and enjoy your victory. That's basically what he's saying, you know. Um, you better not try to come out. Why should Look in verse 10, that thou should indeed smite Edom, and thine heart hath lifted thee up, that is, you're proud now. Glory and tarry at home. For why shouldest thou meddle to thy hurt, that thou shouldest fall, even thou and Judah with thee? Well, that doesn't work. All that did was that provoked Amaziah even more. And now Amaziah is determined that he's going to go into battle. And so he does. Look in verse 11, but Amaziah would not hear. He's actually giving good advice. Look, stay home, revel in your victory. Don't pick a fight with someone who's much bigger and stronger with you. You're You're not going to win this. But he goes into battle, and what happens? In verse 12, and Judah was put to the worst. I like the way to write that. He was put to the worst before Israel. It did not end well. Judah is completely destroyed. The army is destroyed. Jerusalem was partly destroyed. 
And the Lord's treasury was emptied as a result of this battle. Had Amaziah remained in his own land, giving God glory for the victory, follow the leading of the Lord, he would have been fine. But uh, he was lifted up with pride. And what does the Bible say? Pride cometh before a fall, and a haughty, uh, before destruction, and a haughty spirit before a fall. Later on, we're told in 2 Chronicles 25, 25, he was slain, he was murdered in a conspiracy. So it doesn't end well because he's lifted up with pride. He doesn't seek the Lord and he falls. That's one. But there's, a, there's another king who acts in pride. Go to chapter 15 and look down at verse number one. This is Azariah. And it says in verse 1, In the twenty and seventh year of Jeroboam, king of Israel, began Azariah, the son of Amaziah, king of Judah, to reign. Sixteen years old was he when he began to reign, and he reigned two and fifty years in Jerusalem. That's a long time. Here He begins to reign when he's 16. This is the son of Amaziah. And he reigns for 52 years. Now, he's known by another name in Second Chronicles. You know what his name is? Uzziah. That's his name in Chronicles. Uzziah means strength of the Lord, Azariah means help of the Lord. He's elevated to the throne at a fairly young age, 16. He, 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 and he really has sound leadership. If you read 2 Chronicles chapter 26, you're going to find that he does a lot of great things. I mean, he's a builder. He builds up the military. It's a time of prosperity. In fact, the whole nation hasn't really enjoyed this kind of safety and prosperity since the days of Solomon. So he does many good things. There's some things that he didn't do. Look in verse 3 of chapter 15. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his father Amaziah had done, save that the high places were not removed. The people sacrificed and burned incense still in the high places. So there's that one thing again. Keeps popping back up. They didn't, he didn't fully follow the Lord and teach his people to do it. He still has the high places there. But nevertheless... He has a successful reign, as a lot of people would judge success. And when he dies, Isaiah, the prophet, was called by the Lord. You might remember that in Isaiah chapter 6. Maybe it was such, Isaiah held, held him in such high esteem that when uh, this king dies, Isaiah in mourning goes to the temple, and it's there that he sees a vision of God in Isaiah chapter 6. But the writer of Kings is careful to point out that God did something to him. Look down in verse number 5 of chapter 15. And the Lord smote the king so that he was a leper until the day of his death. And he dwelt in a several house. That is a separate house. Why did God strike this king with leprosy? Like father, like son, he was lifted up with pride. And you might want to write these verses down. Second Chronicles 26 gives us the fuller explanation. Chapter 26, verse 16. But when he was strong, his heart was lifted up. To his destruction, sound familiar? <laughs> Almost like it's right out of Proverbs. His heart was lifted up to his destruction, for he transgressed against the Lord his God. He went into the temple of the Lord to burn incense upon the altar of incense. Why would you want to do that? Only priests are supposed to do that. The Bible makes that very clear in the law of Moses. You can't just go into the holy place and burn incense on the altar of incense. There's a certain prescription for how to do that, Who's to do that and when they're to do that? But Uzziah ignores all of that. He's lifted up in pride. He feels like he doesn't have to obey God's word. It doesn't apply to him anymore. And so he goes into the holy place. He seeks to burn incense on the altar of incense. And the Bible says in 2 Chronicles 26, 17, there were 80 priests that met him. You've got to admire these guys. This is the first battle between church and state right here. Here's a government leader coming into the temple trying to do his thing, and the 80 priests withstood him and said, no, you've got to leave. And the Bible says in, in 2 Chronicles 26, 19, Then Uzziah was wroth and had a censer in his hand to burn incense while he was wroth with the priests. The leprosy even rose up in his forehead before the priests in the house of the Lord from beside the incense altar. Well, he lost that battle because God struck him, in his pride, he goes in, he tries to burn incense on the altar. God punishes him for his arrogance and his pride and ignoring God's prescribed way to worship, ignoring the word of God, and now he has to pay a price for that. He'll live the rest of his life in a, 
separate house. According to Leviticus, a leper had to live in a separate house. And now he lives in seclusion until his death. He lost his health. He lost his throne. His son Jotham begins to reign in his stead. We, we read nowhere where he repents, which is interesting to me because this is just my speculation. I think that perhaps if he had truly repented before God, God would have restored him. God's a merciful God. Remember Nebuchadnezzar? He was a proud king that looked at Babylon. Is not this the great Babylon that I have built by my power, my majesty, yada, yada? And then God struck him with insanity. Next thing you know, he's out mooing like a cow and eating grass. And God had to remind him that the most high rules in the kingdom of men, and he gives it to whomsoever he will. And when Nebuchadnezzar came to that realization, he repented. And you know what the Bible says? He was restored. Here God restored this pagan king. Don't you think God will restore a king of Judah if he repented? But we read nowhere of Uzziah's repentance. So this is the lesson that we learn. Pride precedes destruction. But here's lesson number two. We'll go through the rest of these a little quicker. Number two, pride proves depravity. Pride just reveals the wickedness of the human heart. Proverbs 16, 5, everyone that is proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord. You ever bite into an apple and see a worm inside? But you looked at the apple before you bit into it, it was perfect. There was no hole in the outside. How did that worm get in there? It's better seeing a whole worm, by the way, than a half a worm when you bite into it. How, how, how did... How did that worm get in there if the apple was perfect on the outside? Well, a worm laid an egg on an apple blossom, and the apple grew around it. Yeah, so you know the mystery now. The apple was bad from the beginning, and that's the way it is with the human heart. Pride has been in our heart from the very beginning, and it will manifest itself in many ways. It's something that all of us have to deal with. And when we read of these kings, it's revealed, the way it's revealed here in this story is just their utter depravity. Over and over again, we see them where they did evil. Rather than fully rely on the Lord and do what God told them to do, according to Deuteronomy 17, they ignored that and they depended on themselves. And what we see is just their depravity run amok. It just, we just see how evil they are. For example, look in 2 Kings 14, look at verse 23. Here's Jeroboam. This is the second Jeroboam, not the first one. And in the 15th year of Amaziah, the son of Joash, king of Judah, Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel, began to reign in Samaria, and he reigned 40 and one years. Look at verse 24. And he did that which was right, or excuse me, which was evil in the sight of the Lord, and he departed not from all the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nabat, who made Israel to sin. That's Jeroboam the first. Now I know that your head is spinning, saying, I can't keep all these guys together. You know, we have two Jeroboams, we have two Joashes. <laughs> you have to remember, you have two kingdoms here, northern kingdom, southern kingdom. And right now he's talking about a man who reigned in the uh, southern kingdom um, here. Uh, excuse me, the northern kingdom of Israel. See, I can't even keep him right myself. But it says in verse 24, he did that which was evil. And he continues to commit idolatry, the idolatry that was set up by Jeroboam the first. And then we come to Zechariah. Look in 2 Kings chapter 15, look in verse number 8. And the 38th year of Azariah, king of Judah, did Zechariah, the son of Jeroboam, reign over Israel and Samaria six months. Look at verse 9. And he did that which was what? Evil in the sight of the Lord as his fathers had done. Had done. He departed not from the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nabat, who made Israel to sin. And so here is another evil king. He does evil. And then we go to another king, Shalom. Look in verse 13 of chapter 15. Because what happens is Shalom actually, he... he assassinates uh, Jeroboam II, and then he begins to reign. You know how long his reign is? It's one month. Look in chapter 15, verse 13. Shalom, the son of Jabesh, began to reign in the 930th year of Uzziah, king of Judah, and he reigned a full month. I like the way you write that. A full month. 30 days he reigns. And then he's done. Why? Because he's assassinated by Menahem. And look down, and um, he, he, this, is, this guy is also cruel in verse 14. For Menahem, the son of Geda, went up from Tirzah and came to Samaria and smote Shalom, the son of Jabesh, in Samaria, in Samaria and slew him and reigned in his stead. So here is this guy. Now, he reigns for 10 years after he assassinates Shalom, and he is ruthless and he's cruel and he's evil. And, you know, Assyria becomes a world power and causes Menahem to pay tribute, and he raises heavy taxes on the wealthy. Look in verse number 18 
where it says, and he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord, and he departed not all his days from the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nabat, who made Israel to sin. And drop down to verse 20 where it says that Menahem exacted the money of Israel, even of all the mighty men of wealth, of each man 50 shekels of silver to give to the king of Syria. So he, he just raises this heavy taxation uh, to pay off and buy off the king of, of Syria. But he's evil. And then we come to another king, uh, Pekahiah is his name. And in verse number 24, it says that he begins to reign. And in verse 24, it says, and he did that which was what? Evil in the sight of the Lord. And he departed not from the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nabat, who made Israel to sin. Does that sound like a familiar verse? It's the verse that just keeps being played over and over and over again. And he is assassinated by who? By Pekah. It might sound like his little brother, but it's not. Pekahiah is assassinated by Pekah. And in verse 28, and he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord, and he departed not from the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nabat, who made Israel to sin. And he reigns 20 years, and he's an evil king. And then finally, you know how he is, dies? Well, he's assassinated. He's assassinated by Hoshea. The Bible says in verse 28, and he did that which was evil. Oh, we already read that verse, excuse me. Um, but Hosea basically assassinates him. And, uh, and so on we could go, um, you know, just one thing after another. You know, these guys, again, they sound more like mobsters than kings. Kings that are supposed to reign according to the law of God. Kings are, that are supposed to reflect God. Remember, Israel is to be a light and a glory, but they're, they're worse than the nations around them. And it's all because of the pride of these kings. And the depravity of their heart just comes out. We see all these things. But the, but the next guy is really bad. This is King Ahaz in chapter 16. We see his wickedness. And now really the writer focuses on the king. This is a king of Judah. We've been looking at kings of Israel. Here's a king of Judah. And you know how bad he was? He, the Bible says that, you know, he begins to reign. He was in verse 2 of chapter 16. He's 20 years old. He reigned 16 years. He did not that which was right in the sight of the Lord his God, like David his father. Again, he's nowhere, little, nowhere near like David. And it says in verse 3, but he walked in the way of the kings of what? Israel. There were no good kings in Israel. And here's the king of Judah, and he's walking wickedly like they did. Yea, and he made his son to pass through the fire, according to the abominations of the heathen whom the Lord cast out from before the children of Israel. So here he sacrifices his own child to the god Molech. Can you imagine that? A son of David, a king of Judah, sacrificing his son to the god Molech. This is horrible. By the way, thank God for the Supreme Court's decision to strike down Roe versus Wade. But it's also revealed a lot of depravity in our country. It's revealed a lot of a lot of sinful depravity in people's hearts. People want to continue to sacrifice their babies to the God of self. But here, this man, he reigns only 16 years. And later on, to King Josiah, to his credit, will take the valley where, he sacrif- where, where Ahaz sacrificed his son to the God Moloch. Je- Josiah will take that valley and he'll make it a garbage dump to despise what went on there. And that garbage dump the valley of Hinnom became Gehenna. And in Jesus' day, that's what Jesus pointed to as an illustration of hell, where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. It was that garbage dump that was constantly burning and burning. And Jesus used that to speak about hell. But God will punish this man um, as well. But we also see that he becomes a friend of the Assyrians. One day he goes to Assyria. He sees an altar there. Boy, he really likes that altar. Look down in chapter 16. Look down in verse number um, 10, and when King Ahaz went to Damascus to meet tiglath Pileser, king of Assyria, and he saw an altar that was at Damascus, King Ahaz sent to Ur- Ur- Urijah, the priest, the fashion of the altar and the pattern of it according to all the workmanship thereof. So he sees this altar, he falls in love with it, it's a pagan altar. He has a priest build it there in the temple in Jerusalem. And so now all of a sudden you have a pagan altar in the temple. And he's imitating the world in the way he worships. It's something that God hates, by the way. 
We don't need to imitate the world in the way we worship. We need to do it the way God says to it. But here, it's very easy to imitate the world. And Ahaz was a proud, arrogant king that led people away from God, acting independently of God. And so we see his sins, idolatry, murder, child sacrifice, selfish ambition, worldliness. That's the result of pride. Lesson number three. Number one, pride precedes destruction. Pride proves depravity. Number three, pride promotes dissension. The Bible says in Proverbs 13, 10, only by pride comes contention. Think of all the contention that we see here in these two chapters. And it's like the writer is just writing all this down rapid fire to show how out of control things have gotten. And all the the murder and all the scheming and the declaring of war and becoming friends with God's enemies, and imitating the world, the pagan world. That's all opposite of living by faith. That's all opposite of depending upon God. And this illustrates perfectly what James wrote when he said, From whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence even of your own lust that war in your members? Ye lust and have not, ye kill and desire to have, and cannot obtain. Ye fight in war, yet ye have not, because you ask not. And then he says, ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that friendship with the world is enmity with God. These kings have become the enemy of God. But pride causes dissension. Pride causes every argument, starts every war, causes every church split. It's at the root of every divorce, causes every breakup in every home. It all starts with pride. And let me give you the last reason quickly here. Pride provokes deity. It provokes God. The sin of pride is the root of all these other sins that leads the nation down this iniquitous path. And God hates pride. The Bible says everyone that is proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord. That's pretty strong. In Proverbs 16, or excuse me, chapter 6, verses 16 and 17, it's God's hate list. It's a list of all the sins that God hates the most, and on the top of the list, it's a proud look. Pride. God hates it, it provokes his anger. And so let me just show you, we're not supposed to go into chapter 17 yet, but let me give you a little preview. Look in chapter 17, look at verse 7, because this is the writer's assessment of what the Lord did. Chapter 17, verse 7 is, For so it was that the children of Israel had sinned against the Lord their God, which brought them up out of the land of Egypt from under the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and had feared other gods, and walked in the statues of heathen whom the Lord cast out from before the children of Israel, and the kings of Israel which they had made. And the children of Israel did secret those things, secretly those things that were not right against the Lord their God. And they built them high places in all their cities, from the tower of the watchmen to the fenced cities. And they set them up images and groves in every high hill and under every green tree. And there they burnt incense in all the high places, as did the heathen whom the Lord carried away from before them, and wrought wicked things to provoke the Lord to anger. And they served idols where the Lord had said unto them, You shall not do this thing. Yet the Lord testified against Israel and against Judah by all the prophets and by all the seers, saying, Turn ye from your evil ways and keep my commandments and my statutes according to all the law which I command your fathers and which I sent to you by my servants, the prophets. Notwithstanding, they would not hear, but hearkened their hearts like the neck of their fathers. They did not believe in the Lord their God. And they rejected his statutes and his covenant that he made with their fathers and his testimonies, which he testified against them. And they followed vanity and became vain. And they went after the heathen and were round about them concerning whom the Lord had charged them that they should not do like them. And they left all the commandments of the Lord their God and made them molten images, even two calves, and made a grove. And they worshiped all the host of heaven and served Baal. And they caused their sons and their daughters to pass through the fire and used divination and enchantments and sold themselves to do evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to what? Anger. No wonder God was angry with them. Interesting that the bottom of this spiral down that we just read is how they put their children in the fire, sacrifice their own children. And so God was very angry with Israel. Look at verse 18. The Lord, therefore the Lord was very angry with Israel and removed them out of his sight. And there was none left but the tribe of Judah only. So this is the, the northern tribe of Israel, or the northern kingdom of Israel, I should say. They're, they're completely carried off away into exile 
with Assyria. Only thing left now is the southern kingdom of Judah, and they're not far behind. They're not far behind. In fact, the rest of 2 Kings will focus on Judah and show their downward spiral until finally you get to the end of the book and you wonder, is there any hope? Is there any hope? Well, yeah. Yeah. Because the failure of all these earthly kings, you know what it leads to? The one king of kings who will not fail. The one son of David that will fulfill all of God's righteousness, who will be the savior of the world. This all, this all sets the stage for the coming of the real king, the Lord Jesus Christ. He will not fail. All these others did. This gets back to there's only one great king, and that's Jesus Christ. Earthly kings will fail. Earthly kings will fall. And may we be warned of this. Pride is a spirit of independence towards God. We need in America not Pride Month. We need a month of humility and brokenness before God, a brokenness over our sins. James said this, Wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but he gives grace unto the humble. Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. And then he says this, draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Be afflicted and mourn and weep and let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. Humble yourselves, therefore, in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. And that's exactly what we need. Jesus told the story of two men who went into the temple. One was a very real proud Pharisee who said, I, you know, I'm grateful I'm not like that guy over there. He was pointing to the publican the tax collector, who understood his sin. And he was, you know, strutting around the temple like a peacock in the face of God. But here's this poor man, this poor publican, painfully aware of his sin, who beat on his chest, which was a Middle Eastern gesture of mourning, shame, brokenness. And what did he say? God, be merciful to me. And the the article is there in the Greek, not a sinner, but the sinner. God, be merciful to me, the sinner. He thought he was the only sinner around. He thought he was the worst sinner of all. He thought that there was no one that had gone as low as he, and he wouldn't even look up. He didn't feel like he could. He was so broken over his sin. And what did Jesus say? What was the result? Jesus said, that man went away justified. That man went away forgiven. You see, when you humble yourself before God, you'll receive the mercy of God. We have a merciful God who wants to forgive when we come to him in brokenness and true humility. And by the way, if you struggle with this, then I suggest that you meditate on the cross. Meditate on the humility of the king of kings who when he came to this earth, he didn't try to make a name for himself. He laid aside all of his glory. He humbled himself, took upon him the form of a servant. He died in a humiliating way on the cross. Why? Because of your and my sin of pride, which is the root of all of our other sins. He humbled himself. Isaac Watts caught the truth of this when he wrote, When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, my richest gain I count but loss and poor contempt on what? All my pride. The cross should cause us to pour contempt on all pride that we have. And we should humble ourselves before the Lord. Let's, let's bow for prayer together. Father, how we thank you for our Savior, Jesus Christ, the King of kings and Lord of lords, the righteous one, the Messiah, the one who knew no sin, Yet, in humility, when he came to earth, he became sin for us. He took upon himself our sins. And he died in a humbling way so that we might have forgiveness of sin, so that we might have life, so that we might be your children. And how we thank you for that. And, Lord, all of us need to confess that this, is, this sin of pride, it's in all of us, Lord. It's part of our depraved nature. And every day, we have to contend with it. And every day, Lord, we have to remind ourselves of this innate sin 
that came as a result of the fall, this, this inordinate amount of selfless, selfishness and pride that we must crucify, that must be put to death, because we know, Lord, that you can't use proud people, and proud people don't come into the kingdom. It's only those that are poor in spirit, only those that are broken, humbled. And, Lord, that should be the way we continue in the kingdom, not just enter in, but every day of our life as we look at the cross and we contemplate our Savior. May we be humbled and may we live in absolute, total dependence upon you and all that we do. And may that be expressed in our, our attitude of life, our prayer, our walk. Lord, may we learn from these kings not to make the same mistake. And we pray all this in Jesus' wonderful, matchless name. Amen.